Welcome to Kidney Journeys, a program brought to you by patients for patients with kidney disease and their families, hosted by The Road Back to Life, a mentoring group for kidney patients. For more information on The Road Back to Life, visit us at www.theroadbacktolife.com. Now here's your host. We wanted to thank everybody for listening or viewing our podcast or video cast today. Uh, we have a very interesting show. So it's, it's kind of us answering some of those questions that you guys have if you're getting ready to start dialysis, whatever type of dialysis it may be. Uh, so we just want to help you guys with our personal experiences, not offering any medical advice, but just what we've gone through personally to maybe, you know, guide you a little bit in what you may experience or just, you know, give you an idea. So um, we're just here to help. So uh, we have a few people here on the show today. Most of us are here in Washington and dealing with thick smoke uh, since it's September. Um, So we have Bob, our producer. (laughs) We have Charity and we have Walt and we just want to thank you guys for being here. And then of course we have Don over in Colorado Springs. How's it going, Don? How's everybody? Oh, I'm doing good, as always, and, and I hope everybody else is, and and today's a, is, is really kind of a special day for us. We're going to have a little fun with this, not because the topic's funny or fun, it's just that we don't get to meet like this all the time, and, and you out there who are listening and viewing us, I uh, get to see five members of the Road Back to Life, three of which have been transplanted, and two which are still on dialysis, and they're both used doing two different types of dialysis. So this is about dialysis and access questions. People who have been on Facebook or other places have these questions of what it's all about, and and they have no idea because the answers aren't out there. And so, uh, we have been through a lot of this stuff, and we're going to tell you our experiences and uh, and give you some of our answers on how we did this and how we got through it, okay? Now, to begin with, a lot of people want to know what type uh, of access options are available to, to people on dialysis. And, and then uh, the other part of that question is, is which ones are specific to hemodialysis and which ones are specific to peritoneal? Okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you, tell you right from the very beginning, there are four kinds of dialysis. And the four kinds of dialysis are, you have four, you have the one for the catheter that goes in your chest or your neck, which is a type of hemodialysis. You have hemodialysis, which is generally uh, accessed uh, through um, your arm. And then you have uh, peritoneal dialysis, which is an exchange that goes through your abdomen area. And the fourth means of dialysis is, and it may shock you, but it's considered the fourth dialysis. It's not a, uh, it's not a cure. And that is transplant. So with all those four out there, um, so um, who would like to start out with, I've had the catheters in my neck or chest area. How did that come about, maybe? Uh, How did you deal with that? Um, All the little questions that maybe you had, uh, you had to figure out yourself. So uh, guys, which ones have you had? Raise your hand. Okay. (laughs) I was really lucky. I didn't have to have a catheter, Don. I, I had time to get a fistula prepared before I started dialysis. Yeah, and that's and that's the smart way of doing it. But you know, there's a large portion of people that end up in the hospital 
uh, thinking they got the flu and they find out that their kidneys are shot and they've got to go into <laughs> an emergency situation because they don't have time to have a permanent access put in. They actually, you know, would you like to speak to um, us a little sure. bit about that? I, I, for me, I guess I didn't know that um, they didn't use your own veins. So I just thought, you know, like when you get your blood draw, you know, that's how it works. And, um, and then they informed me that your arteries and veins um, are too small. <laughs> so to be kind of pumping that much blood. And so I have very tiny arteries and veins. And so I could not get a fistula. And I'll let other people talk about that who have an experience with what that is. Uh, so I got a, a graft. It's basically like a flexible tube. They put in your arm. They put mine in my upper arm. So kind of up near my bicep. So if I flip my arm over like for a blood draw, it's right on top there. Um, yeah, so I, um, I have a graft. Uh, I started with peritoneal dialysis. Uh, so I had a catheter in my abdomen area. Um, that only lasted about four months. We weren't expecting that to not work for me. So I had to go in for surgery, get my catheter removed that I was using for peritoneal dialysis. I had a chest catheter put in um, up near my chest, which goes straight into your heart. And then I also had a graft put in my upper arm. So that they kind of tunnel through, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but um, yeah, they, they put in your arm and um, yeah. And so I, I had experience with three different ones. Wow. Uh, yeah. Very quickly in a short amount of time too. It was kind of like surgery after surgery, getting a new one put in and one taken out. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and some of us are really, really fortunate. They, we go in and we have chosen what type of uh, dialysis we'd like to do. And we go in and, and have, have um, let's say it's, it's official we have put in. We go in and we have it put in. And then we don't have a problem with it. But then there are individuals who um, have had struggles along those lines. Uh, Bob, you've had a fistula, right? I still do. Absolutely. Yes, I got my fistula, but like I said earlier, I got it before I even had to go on dialysis. But, you know, my case is one of the... Actually, Don, you know, the real number is is 80% of the people who start dialysis start from the emergency room. That's yeah. their first experience with even the term dialysis or nephrologist. It's all... Uh, a really scary, scary time. But I'm lucky enough to be one of the 20% that, if you call it lucky, uh, had foreknowledge. But for me, I have polycystic kidney disease. So, you know, that's hereditary. I knew that I was going to be having it. I was diagnosed at 12. Uh, so I, you know, like I said, I planned it and I knew that I wanted to do hemodialysis which is the one that uses needles. And we can describe that later, that actually filters your blood uh, mechanically. And so, yeah, I got my fistula put in in 2007. And it cured, I mean, it healed right away. It's still working beautifully. Um, as far as the thrill and the flow, I have no troubles with it. I got really good dialysis through it. You know, and, and that's how it can be. Not all of my friends and the people that I dialyzed with has such good luck. Well, but, Bob, you, you mentioned a term that one would not expect to be used in a fistula or in dialysis, and that's the word thrill. You know, there, there's not many thrills involved in this. <laughs> Don, you're right. You know, absolutely right. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, thrill is what the medical uh, community calls uh, the sound or the feel, the vibration. See, this is my fistula right here, and if you put your hand like this, you can actually feel a vibration and it goes with your heartbeat and it, and it kind of buzzes. It's really kind of cool. And that is what they call the thrill. So every time I went into the dialysis center, the nurse or the technician would rest their hand on there and made sure that it felt normal before they would hook me up to the machine. And, and so I've been doing that now for 13 years and because I still do it every day, you know, and, but yes, I'm sorry about that. You're right. It, I shouldn't use the word thrill without explaining what a thrill is. It's not a, a roller coaster ride, no. <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. We're all going to do that today, myself included, probably. Yeah. You know, we're going to use terms that we're we're used to using because we've been doing this a while. Absolutely. Okay? And I'm going to say, Walt, okay. Can I just one more thing? No. 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 Go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, I know for a fact that now you're going to say, okay, you told me what thrill is, but what causes the thrill? And it's it's really kind of cool. You know, I'm a mechanic. So I love this, the idea of how things work. And when I asked my doctor, he says, well, you know, we did hook your uh, artery up to your vein and the blood is now making a loop. That is the turbulence caused by that. And that's what you feel is the vibration from the turbulence of the blood making a 180 degree turn. So yeah. that's very yeah. cool. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of like a Beach Boys song. Good vibrations. Right? Good vibrations. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. And you can hear it in your pillow when you go to sleep at night, too. Yes, you wow. can. Mine was wow. under my, I sleep like mm -hmm. this with my hand under my pillow and I'm not supposed to, but I did. Yeah. And I heard it. I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Walt, did you have, uh, you go to hemodialysis. Tell us a little bit about your situation, how you do it. Uh, I go to, to dialysis uh, four days a week. So it actually has turned out to be a part-time job that I didn't <laughs> apply for. <laughs> uh, I, spent, I spend about 30 hours a week at hemodialysis uh, for the last seven years. Yeah, and he hasn't missed a day, and that's key. Hasn't missed a day. So what type of access do you have? Uh, I started out with uh, a catheter in my neck because I fell into the 80% of the people that have an emergency catheter put in. Uh, and I had the catheter in my neck directly to my heart for over a year uh, as I was getting ready for the surgery to have a fistula put into my arm. And why is it so important? To, I mean, if, it, if the catheter is already in your neck and it's working good, why would you want to put a fistula in? Uh, the challenge with the catheter is the infection rate because it's directly, it goes directly into your heart. Um, and they want that access to be as limited as possible because when you take a shower, you can actually get infection into your blood system through the shower through all the bacteria that comes out of the water. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's really, really important because a lot of centers have to fight people almost to get them to get scheduled in to get a fistula if they're gonna use hemodialysis or go in and get uh, their um, access in for peritoneal. And, and, and because it's just, so easy that there's no needles involved there's there's no nothing involved they just sit in a chair and the tech hooks them up and away they go the sad part is is a lot of people get infections and when you get infections in your blood that close to your heart it it, it can be deadly and i don't know how else to put it it can be deadly so you yeah, kill you quick <laughs> What's that? According to the to my surgeon, uh, it'll kill you quick. Yeah, and, and so and, and and so that's why it's so important to, if you can, get an access put in. But now we're going to talk a little bit, maybe a little bit different kind of access. And and, and charity down here is 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 our gal. <laughs> <laughs> this is and it's and it's working good for her but she does it a little differently. And what kind of an access do you have? Well, currently I have peritoneal dialysis catheter, which um, is a super fancy term for a plastic tube sticking out of my belly. <laughs> actually. Um, and I'm actually connected oh, to dialysis. Oh, here she goes. <laughs> oh, so cool. Here's yeah. my tube. <laughs> So she's doing an, an exchange right now as, as while, while we're doing this, guys. So, yes. and she's at home. Morning for me. <laughs> that we're doing, I'm doing it right now. Um, that's surgically placed. You have to know um, a little bit in advance 
um, that you're doing dialysis to get one of those um, and skip hemo dialysis uh, completely. So uh, I've been doing dialysis or some kind of kidney treatment, one of the four, uh, for 22 years. So when I was 20, I was one of the 80% that was <laughs> in the hospital and they said it's time for dialysis and they stuck that thing in my neck. And I started hemo and that nobody really explained that either, but that's just like this plastic tube that's sticking out of your chest. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's a little awkward to have. Um, so I don't, I don't understand why people want to keep it for so long <laughs> and not get it. <laughs> um, but I was 20 years old and fairly vain, so maybe that was just <laughs> a young person thing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think that's it at all. I, I just think it's it's uh, a lot of people say, "Well, I, I'm I'm really afraid of needles." If you got yes. kidney disease, you yes. better get over that. That's all I got to say. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to. Well, <laughs> you no, can but do I, I'm just needle. saying you're going to get poked with needles. <laughs> Whether it's hemodialysis or not, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you're going to have blood draws, you're going to get shots, you're going to get all that right, stuff. Right. That's true. <laughs> but I only get it once a month. So I get one lab draw a month, one shot a month. It's not bad. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah well. Uh, I get needles stuck in me eight times a week, yeah. right. so, and, and I don't like needles. Right. Yeah. I, I had to get over it pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something you got to do, you know. Uh, and you're not a voodoo doll, you know. So <laughs> you just feel a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so here's here's the the gist of it. Uh, there are four types of dialysis. If you find yourself in a hospital and because you felt sick and and you um, you know they, they they take you in the back and the doctor comes up and he says uh, that you have ESRD. I want you to understand ESRD means end stage renal disease. And that means your kidneys aren't functioning well enough to sustain life for very much longer. Both. And kidneys. Sorry. Both yes, kidneys. both. People both ask kidneys. that a lot. Is it both? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's both. kidneys rarely go bad one at a time. Okay, <laughs> so it's both. And you probably know this if one went bad at, at the time. So so here here's the deal. It's end stage. Renal disease, renal meaning kidney. Then the next thing you hear is we're going to put some catheters in your neck and we're going to get you on an analysis machine. You're going to need to find a nephrologist when we kick you out of here in the hospital and, and a dialysis center. All these are strange words. ESRD, end-stage renal disease, dialysis is uh, an outside way of cleaning your your blood uh, from the toxins that are in it that's killing you because your kidneys aren't working. Um, a uh, nephrologist is simply a doctor who specializes in kidney disease and kidney things. And a dialysis center is where you go to have your dialysis done. And the option should you have from that point on is, is up to you. If you find yourself with catheters in your chest, then you do have a certain amount of time to get a fistula put in or, or a peritoneal catheter put in. Um, and also, if you know way before that, then you need to get hooked up to a nephrologist who can help you make the decisions you need to make about what kind of access, what your lifestyle is, and everything else. And, and so with that, 
Ashley, would you like to take question number two? I would. So, because <laughs> a lot of people may not know this, but um, what type of doctor or surgeon is responsible for placing your dialysis access site? Because I'm guessing it's not your primary care provider. So, <laughs> who would like to answer that one? I got that one. Go ahead, Walt. Uh, I was introduced to a uh, vascular surgeon, uh, which is the guy that actually drew the drew the diagram on my arm on to where he was going to place it uh so it does require a surgeon to do it uh and then the one thing that i thought was peculiar was he asked me if i was left-handed or right-handed and i told him i was left-handed and he put the fistula in my right arm because they want to they want you to have access to sign things uh, that you're going to be signing a lot of after your surgeries. <laughs> Plus, I think when I was on on dialysis, I uh, I did things, and I could, if I was right-handed, you know, then with my left arm not being able to to move it very much, I could still function. I could still read a book. I could. I changed channels on TV <laughs> or whatever. Bob? I'm going to throw it right out there for you guys. Um, when I talked to my vascular surgeon, I said, I want to put my own needles in. Will you please put it in my left arm? Good and for you, Bob. Yeah. And he said, yeah. So he put it, I have, and you know, honestly, I have really good veins. I'm really lucky that way. And so he put it in a really good ax, a really good spot that was really ideal for me. And I did put my own needles in uh, for my dialysis treatment. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons for this. Uh, there's, there's fear involved in dialysis when people, different people hook you up to the machine, put your needles in and stuff. You know, and it's, it's, it's a real concern. People are afraid. And you know what, I did it. So if anything went wrong, it was my fault. And, and I knew the guy that put my needles in pretty well, right? So I trusted me. Um, so that was a really good benefit for me. I, wherever I went, I always put them in and for traveling or for hospital stays. Uh, I had one less thing to worry about. Also the benefit of doing this yourself, you have more control over your treatment and it sets you up for uh, the possibility of getting home treatment, uh, home hemodialysis, which is the kind that filters your blood. Uh, so, so that's why I got my fish still in my left arm. So, so Charity and Ashley both had peritoneal. Do you use a vascular surgeon in that? Go ahead, Charity. <laughs> you have more experience. <laughs> Was he a vascular surgeon? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I did, anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was definitely a surgeon. I actually uh, had a bad experience the second time around. So um, I've done peritoneal twice um, and I had a transplant in between. So uh, the first time it was a good catheter, no problem. The second time um, the surgeon that did it uh, didn't didn't do a great job. It actually um, was going up and out and it's, yeah. So uh, once I woke up with that problem, <laughs> uh, uh, it was usable, but um, they, they, they really want it pointing down. Um, and so, uh, I didn't have that one for very long and um, I was I was fairly unhappy with it. It was really high up in my belly too. So it was a little difficult for me to get to and you have to be able to get to it to clean it well um, because that's the big risk with peritoneal dialysis is keeping your catheter site clean so that you don't get an infection. Um, because uh, that infection can be deadly also. Um, infection is just bad news all the way around. <laughs> um, so I had to go back actually and um, 
complain to them about this catheter that this guy put in. And then I had the head of uh, vascular surgery down at Virginia Mason do my second one, which my PD nurse gave like a C plus. So it still isn't going down. It's kind of going off to the side a little bit, but um, it works. I've had it for four years now and I haven't had any infection or any problem, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it was vascular surgery. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't remember. Definitely a surgeon, though. <laughs> Definitely a surgeon. Quickly, and you, actually. And you want a good one, actually, that does a lot of them, preferably. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that a lot of you, too, if you are doing hemodialysis and you have a fistula or a graft, before, your sur before you meet with your surgeon, you'll probably have uh, vein mapping which is done with a ultrasound and they go over, well, I mean, I did it, so I'm assuming others do it. Yeah. And they go over your arms yeah. and they, you know, they can figure out the size and the width. They can see where there are larger ones and basically give, you know, like a recommendation of a good spot um, for you to have like a fistula created or um, if you can't like a graph placed. So just just one, one minute, you. guys. We're, we're, we're running out of time here, and I, I, I want to get to you. But uh, right now, uh, I think we're going we're gonna to break. Um, we're, our time is kind of like up. <laughs> and we're going to come back. We'll do a part two. We're going to come back, and we're going to let these guys finish. Uh, but please, please pay attention to what we're saying. Remember I said there was a fourth one and that was dialysis. If you're one of the 20% the that know that your kidneys are failing, uh, we have a member, uh, she's not with us, who did her due diligence and was fortunate enough to get a transplant and never did have to do dialysis on the machine. So her dialysis went right from, from her being, her kidneys going bad to getting a transplant. Anyway, this is Donna and Ashley. And today, Bob, Walt, and Charity all saying, be kind to one another. This is Kidney Journeys and the team at The Road Back to Life saying thank you for listening and for allowing us to be a part of your journey. For more information on The Road Back to Life, visit us at www.theroadbacktolife.com. Also, consider subscribing to our channel so we can keep you updated with new content and videos. Remember, we're all in this together. Now go out and be kind to one another.